Now I shall introduce the final speaker of this afternoon session, Mr. Shashwat Das, Director, Sun Maestra Energy Private Limited, Chennai, India. Shashwat is a marine engineer by education, renewable energy enthusiast, and an energy conservationist, passionate about technology and nature. Let us now proceed to Mr. Shashwat's presentation. Good day. I'm Sashwat Das, uh, director of Sun Maestra Energy Private Limited. We're based out of Chennai. We're a young startup. Uh, I'm a marine engineer by education and training. I have uh, served in se several capacities uh, for the shipping industry. And uh, I have then worked with the renewable energy space and energy management space for about eight years. Um, I am extremely passionate about the environment and technology providing solutions towards conservation of energy and the environment. So uh, I'm here to introduce you to a design philosophy behind net zero and going beyond. I'd like to thank SRM uh, for this wonderful opportunity to present uh, I'd like to especially thank the School of Architecture and Interior Design, uh, Mr. Anup Menon, uh, the entire team behind this wonderful platform, which uh, is a great knowledge sharing platform uh, of various uh, experts and uh, experienced personnel. Um, it is a wonderful archive of thoughts and designs and ideas which can help the uh, generation ahead plan for what's coming up with the challenges of climate change. I will now proceed to my presentation, uh, which is about uh, net zero. And uh, I'm going to uh, take you through a few slides and uh, I'm going to discuss more uh, about what actually needs to be done uh, going forward so that we have more sustainable uh, buildings and how we could help the environment further. So uh, thinking within our means is the tagline of this uh, presentation. So uh, the UN releases the uh, global status report and in the last global status report of 2017, uh, near zero or zero emission buildings need to become the construction standard globally within the next decade. So this was in 2017 and we are at 2021 and we need to see have we actually moved in this direction and how are we uh, looking at this from the uh, Indian context. Uh, the building sector alone is responsible for a whopping 39% of global emissions and uh, according to the report and this includes embodied carbon of building materials and it also makes this the building sector the single largest contributor for global warming among other sectors so it's a it's a steep challenge and uh, what we have next is uh, two important definitions for this presentation embodied energy embodied energy is the energy consumed by the building at the time of construction and that's all the processes associated with the production of a building that's mining excavation uh, producing of upvc or aluminium or the steel which is used to uh, finally deliver the product so this energy is once installed remains constant that's energy spent and lost and the second most important thing is operational energy once a building is ready, what's next? The, the 
in once it is inhabited and has an occupancy energy will be consumed uh by the building on a daily basis and that needs uh and that demand has to be met on a daily basis so here's an example uh, this is from australia though i mean uh, how much energy do how much how much energy is embodied energy actually and how big a sig how significant is an impact of operational energy so if you look at this here if we have a high operating standard or a normal operating or a low operating standard you will see that operational energy will always exceed the embodied energy of a building and unless the embodied energy was uh, extremely crude and uh, was wasteful at the time of construction or never saw occupancy rates uh, significantly so that being said what is net zero net zero refers to the balance between the amount of greenhouse gases produced and how much is removed from the atmosphere and that balance is uh, net zero so we have not taken away more than what we have contributed so not so amazing fact coming back to why the building sector or why is this important as a discussion is that the share of global energy uh, related co2 em em emissions in the sector in 2015 showed the construction energy uh, construction industry was responsible for about 11% of the total global greenhouse gases and you can see the categories that's residential residential indirectly non residential and uh, non residential indirectly so what this tells us is that buildings the residential buildings have had a huge huge impact in terms of global emissions and that's why we need to look at the way we build so what do architects have to do with this 30% i mean this is the energy consumption the previous one was emissions so in with respect to energy consumption 30% of global energy consumption is on buildings and you can see that residential buildings consume about 22% and non residential at 8% this is an amazing number to look at because in the recent days with the impact of covid it's uh, it is significant to understand that more people are now working from home so what is the energy impact now in the residential sector and the decline in non residential construction uh, there are more people working from home so residential buildings will consume a lot more energy so what is the uh, outlet so over a 50 year period you'll realize that the embodied energy is about 28% or uh, or lesser uh, than the operational energy so if a building were to live for 50 years the operational energy used by it would far exceed the energy used for construction which makes it very important to focus a lot more on the occupancy aspects of buildings as well so i've borrowed this from edge what does uh, embodied energy comprise of it's the proportion of materials used in the building sector versus other uses and you'll see that steel glass concrete and aluminium all have a major contributing factors in terms of uh, their energy consumption and concrete is right up there and so is glazing for glass aluminium and steel and these are huge contributory factors towards the energy used in construction so there's a call to action climate change is rapidly escalating and uh, we have a lot of work to do for building professionals especially because we need to push the whole idea of energy efficiency if buildings aren't going to be more efficient we cannot manage the energy demand because not all of it comes from a renewable source and the more amount of carbon being added and the rapid growth of construction it is going to be unsustainable sooner than later going on to the next slide from an indian context what are the embodied energy calculations what are low carbon materials and how many manufacturers declare tpds or a life cycle energy analysis so most of you are familiar with the lead or the green building 
requirements will understand that building materials are only certified green once there are declarations by the manufacturers about what is the source of materials what is the energy spent what is the life cycle of the so we do not usually have this information when we are constructing so we need to focus a lot more and ask manufacturers to declare these this information we need to work on the regulatory aspects of materials use sustainable materials but beyond that my focus is now towards operational energy uh improving energy consumption strategies you know uh, will have uh, a massive impact on the operational energy of a building as you as i have shown you on the previous slides that the operational energy is the most significant uh, energy uh depending on climatic zones energy is largely spent on heating cooling and lighting the uh, key question is that uh can a building generate enough of energy for it to sustain and not need anything from from another source and is that even possible so what is the operational energy footprint of a building and uh, you know we have various categories of buildings uh, hospitals there are um, apartments there are malls there are various sectors and there is a certain amount of benchmarking that has been done in terms of types of buildings and what is the uh, typical floor area and what is their benchmark in terms of what is the energy spent so uh, here you can see uh, a few samples here uh, from a report by usaid um this is to tell us that uh how much energy is consumed in kilowatt hours per meter square per year the key question again can all of this energy that we uh, need can it be generated from a building system and uh, that it can sustain completely can buildings take the shape of endemic trees around us which obviously meet the energy demand uh, completely um, the inspiration being trees because they're the most common things that one sees yet and are completely self sustaining and grow well with others so the focus is on photosynthesis uh, uh, a banyan tree here by the sheer shape of its canopy produces enough energy to grow and then maintain itself for 80 100 years or beyond so coming back to consumption versus production uh if the epi of a building was about 180 kilowatt hours per meter square per year um, they declared as ecbc compliant and uh, imagine a building which is which has a 8000 uh, meter square floor space and it has four floors and would need approximately 3945 kilowatt hours of energy per day uh depending on the category of building and hours of operation renewable energy can be deployed to reduce the energy source from the grid uh however how much of this can be met by solar now coming back to the tree i'm going back to this because that's one of the easiest plug and play technologies that's available which can have direct impact on a building's energy consumption so this is a solar irradiance map of india and mostly mostly we are in a segment which is above 1700 kilowatt hours per meter square uh to 2150 in certain parts so with all this sunlight available it seems that it should be the obvious path forward uh i'm focusing a lot more on solar as such as a strategy rather than uh, wind at this point so going back to our example of the building with 8000 square feet uh, 8000 square meters of floor space and with an energy demand of 3945 kilowatt hours per day 60% of it is likely to be consumed during solar hours because of the need for additional cooling or because of activity and things like that so here we're just assuming that it's a 24 hour cycle for this building 
and uh, the energy consumption primarily is going to happen during the day. So if 2000 meter square of space was available on the rooftop and this was it could actually generate about 2100 kilowatt hours per day and meet almost 50% of the daily requirement of the building which is significant 50% of the energy requirement from a source which is renewable which has the lowest transmission losses because it's on the rooftop and is also providing a cooling effect of taking the heat off the roof uh, this is more from an indian context it has a major major contribution so and if the energy demand of the building was lower due to an efficient design and the modeling was right and the natural air circulation was great the need for more energy would have been further reduced and therefore it could actually mean that it could contribute to a much higher percentage of the total energy required it could even come to the point where solar could be used with energy storage and the energy excess energy generated during the daytime would be used in the evening for uh, providing uh, power to the building in the evenings but what is the approach towards our rooftops typically i mean i've just shared some common imagery from google images but this isn't very different the roof is usually an afterthought uh, everything that one doesn't want to see is usually plonked up there and from a renewable energy perspective seeing the number of obstructions and the shadows that it leaves it becomes nearly impossible to use any of these spaces productively for renewable energy so the same floor space that was available could yield less than 5% or 2.5% of the net energy demand which makes it counterproductive so there it's very important to focus a lot more say that let's have a bottom down uh, you know uh, uh, a top down approach going forward and let's start with buildings with let's look at the roof first uh, what does the roof offer what is this roof space available and how do we use it to the maximum solar potential let's have lesser obstructions uh, let's have the water tanks in the right locations let's have uh, you know antennas and other obstructions positioned in a way that it doesn't harm the energy generation that's an important aspect to look at is uh, is the technology that we're looking at relevant is the uh, are we maximizing when the building is being constructed and has a life for 50 years are we looking at a strategy where the solar plant is the most efficient at the time of installation because the real estate is a premium it's not easy to add more solar once you have maxed out the space so and can can we uh, can all the energy consumed within this building be met by the solar potential of the rooftop i mean that's to me the most interesting question saying that if the building only had 2100 uh, kilowatt hours of energy generation and this would mean that the energy consumption within the building would have to be forced to trim itself use lesser air conditioning or use more natural ways of uh, providing power to actually meet uh, its solar potential and that is not an easy task and that's why it's very important to focus a lot more on design but you have results like this where creative rooftops augment the energy production of a building and uh, at the same time uh, use of solar can be in such a way that it provides a creative space underneath which can be used for uh, gardening for green rooftops for various other things as well and which contributes to the uh, well-being of the inhabitants as well as the energy demand of the building so that primarily was my uh, presentation and uh, i wanted to share these thoughts uh, i've been hugely inspired by a building 
uh, in Singapore, uh, which uh, at the NUS, which is the uh, uh, you know the School of Design and Environment, and for a hot and humid environment, for a building to be uh, a green mark platinum uh, certified building, which hardly uses uh, air conditioning, which uses all its energy from a renewable source is truly inspiring. So I'd like to end my presentation with uh, that most humans are inspired from nature and we don't need to really look too far beyond a tree. Uh, a tree has everything and it outlives us all and most of the buildings that we build. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sasud, for your presentation. We'll take a short break for our sponsor video. Free flow is a self compacting concrete. After pouring into the form, this concrete makes its way through steel and narrow spaces to completely fill the structure without any cavities, without any manual labor involvement. Ultratech Free Flow Plus has been awarded Green Pro Certification Product by Green Products and Service Council. Benefits to the end customer Free Flow is highly durable and it increases life of structure as this concrete allows complicated designs without any voids. Faster work as concrete placement is very fast and no compaction is required. Cost effective as less manpower is required at site. Reduction in noise pollution as Ultratech free flow does not require vibrators. It also saves cost. Superior surface finish as it has unique self-compacting feature. Improved durability due to denser microstructure of concrete. This concrete does not have any voids, so there are no leakage problems. Benefits for applicators and technical influencers. Reduction in time and resources required for compaction and placement of concrete. It enables speedy construction and reduction in manpower at site, thus resulting in labor savings. Faster construction allows applicators to take more projects. Greater freedom in designing complicated, intricate and elegant structures. It gives superior surface finish without any blemishes and patchwork, so the contractor has a goodwill in the market. Reduction in noise pollution, as Ultratech free flow does not require vibrators, it also saves cost. Free flow Plus is designed using special high performance plasticizers and viscosity modifying agents. In order to give a highly flowable and self compacting concrete mix, Free Flow Plus is delivered at sites using 5 to 6 cubic meters transit mixers and also 12 liter buckets for smaller quantities. On arrival, concrete should be tested for its workability and flowability. Before application, the formwork should be sturdy, leak proof, and clean from debris. Ultratech Free Flow Plus, being a flowable concrete product, exercises higher hydrostatic pressure on the formwork. There should be a lot more care in setting up the formwork support to ensure safety at site since it is a high pressure. It requires minimum manual efforts in spreading and compacting. Normally, Ultratech Free Flow Plus would not require use of needle vibrators. In case of heavily reinforced structures, only a minor need of needle vibrator should suffice. In case during concreting, leakages are observed from the formwork, the pouring should be temporarily halted and resumed after plugging the leakages. While concreting, in hot weather, water may be sprinkled over the reinforcement and formwork to bring the temperature to normal conditions. The surface should be protected from sunlight and wind to prevent evaporation of water from concrete and protect it from shrinkage and cracking. Normal methods adopted are water sprinkling, covering by tarpaulin sheets, wet heat in clothes, or misting, humidification. After the hardening of concrete, it can be ponded with water for 7 to 14 days.